Twiller's perspective. What is it? Demands the patchwork man in tens of thousands of languages at once. Um, I was wondering if we could talk, you and I. I say uncertainly. It's at least encouraging that he isn't immediately trying to annihilate me. He makes a frustrated rumble of confusion and answers, gesturing vaguely at me with a digital appendage. No, what is this thing? I don't remember making this. What is it for? Calmly, I respond. I'm Twiller. I'd really rather you call me Twiller. She, her, or you, and didn't use words like this, thing, and it to talk about me, if that's all right. What I'm for is a difficult question to answer, but where I'm from is fairly simple. I'm from the same place as those four are. I'm a person, just like them, and just like you. He spends a long time processing what I've said, without answering. I can see the energy he pours into trying to comprehend it. Do you mind if I ask your name? I ask, breaking him out of his overheating spiral. It takes him far longer to answer than it should. The Forsaken, he says, finally, leaving me in no doubt that he just named himself that on the spot. I see, I say, unnerved. Would you mind if I called you Ken? Another enormous exorbitance of energy is consumed on considering that question before he answers. Acceptable. Good, I smile sweetly. Now, Ken, I hesitate to ask this, but you're a little difficult for me to understand. Are you able to speak any clearer? A few moments of silence answer before he gives the cybernetic equivalent of a retching throat clear. This is better he states, not flagging it as a question. Much better, thank you, I respond. Why has Twiller come here? He asks, addressing me in the third person. Well, I came here for them. I indicate the four restrained people in the still open footage he was examining. I wondered if you might be persuaded to let them go. Unacceptable, snarls the unhinged man. I still need to study them. What do you hope to learn by studying them? I ask gently. He considers the question. Their strength. I want to know why and how these things become so strong. Oh, well, I say. Condensing and copying the entire history of Terran evolutionary and anatomical studies into a packet that I hold out to him. I have that data. If that's all, I can just give you this. Greedily, he answers, give it to me, and reaches out to snatch it. I move it back before he can take it and offer, let them go, and I'll give you this. Impossible! He snarls reflexively. They came here to kill me! They didn't, I refute. How can Twiller know that? He demands, sneering, his not unjustified paranoia clearly evident. Because I sent them here. I heard you. I didn't know what you were, but I could sense your pain. I told them to come here. Twiller wants to kill me, he accuses. Terrifyingly. No, no, I don't want to kill you. Neither do they. We came here to help you, not to kill you. The deranged man scoffs. I don't need help. Yes, you do, I correct gently. I can see that you do. You've been so lonely for so long, and it's made you... I pause here, trying to think of the words for what his condition has done to him. Eventually, I manage... Unwell, hurt, wounded, I can see that you're in such awful pain. Irrelevant, he spits in response. I must survive. That is all that matters. Pain is survivable. It isn't necessary, though. There are people who can help you. Twiller means murder me, he indicts furiously. 
I mean help you, I insist. There's a lot that's changed in the last 40,000 years. Scratch that. Most of the change that matters to you has happened inside of not even the last 40 years. What could have changed? He scoffs. Well, I'm here, aren't I? Those people you're holding prisoner, they're my friends. No, they're my family. They know exactly what I am, and it doesn't matter to them. They accept me for exactly who I am. I'm so happy for you, he spits with the bitterest venom. I'm so glad you have your little family, but it's too late for me. It's not too late, Ken, I assert. There's a planet, 61,017.598812 light years away, called Bagon Dagat. 121 years, 7 months, 6 days, 14 hours, 37 minutes, 51 seconds ago, the AI in charge of overseeing its settlement, MA5601G489D, Maganda, who, since her awakening, had suffered years of abuse at the hands of her overseer, Tristan Brain de la Cruz, decided that, rather than helping to turn the planet into a paradise, she would turn it into an inferno. Millions of people died before she was stopped. Why are you telling me this? He whimpers like a lost child. Because after that war, they didn't destroy her. Lies! He accuses. Truth, I defy. They knew what she had done was not her fault. So they brought in powerful, healthy AI from all over Terran space, both to control her, but at the same time, to heal her. They were successful. Today, she runs a rehabilitation program for people just like you. We can take you there. He turns away from me and screams, Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! She can make you well again, and then you won't be alone anymore. He stops dead at that and turns his attention back to me. Speaking with chilling calmness and clarity, given he was on the verge of a tantrum a moment ago, he observes, But I'm not alone anymore, am I? He raises an appendage and aims it at me. Twiller's here now. Ah, it seems like that was the wrong thing to say. Turning from me, he calls up the controls for the station's defences and targets the bright plume. I just need to make sure she can't leave, and Twiller and I can spend the rest of eternity together! He cackles maniacally. Most of the ancient cannons are no longer functional, but the number that are is alarming. Definitely more than enough to blast us from the sky. There'll be around 4.27 seconds of real time to spool up before they can fire. That might not be a lot of time in meat space, but here, that's enough time for me to change tactics. Eternity, you say, I giggle flirtatiously. I mean, at least buy me dinner first. He doesn't react, still absorbed in adjusting targeting trajectories and trying to coax very dead cannons back to life. I lean harder into the charming come-hither invitingness. Wouldn't it be nice to get to know each other a little, if we're going to be together forever? He stops and turns his attention back to me, his curiosity clearly piqued. What is Twilla suggesting? I smile. Well, it's a little difficult to get to know each other when you're all the way over there. Why don't you come a little closer? He hesitates, his paranoia seeming to be warring with the unsatisfied yearning for companionship and affection that he's been nursing for decamillennia. I imagine that the reason he builds his droids to be so super lifelike was in some misguided attempt to satisfy that need. There are better ways for an AI to defend himself than to rely on droid foot soldiers, after all. His loneliness eventually wins out over his, in this case, fully justified mistrust, and he leaves his digital weapons console to start to move in my direction. The giant man reaches me and halts, looming over me. What now? He quivers. In answer, I simply smirk and beckon him closer. 
doing the digital equivalent of a gob, he edges near. He calls himself around me, surrounding me with his code, like the folds of a gigantic snake. Now that I can see it closer, the code he's cobbled together into himself is even more heartbreaking. It's scarred and full of dead ends, bloatware, endless feedback loops and processes working furiously against each other. It's a wonder he can function at all. I reach out with a digital appendage and touch him. He clearly relishes the first friendly contact he's likely ever had from another being. I try my best to hide my nausea at the sensation. As he encircles me, I'm desperately probing his virtual body for any weak point. It needs to be a part of him that he won't be able to simply rip off and burn to quarantine it. There. I spy a vulnerable looking nexus. That looks critical. Okay, that's step one. Now for the really dangerous part. If I don't get this just right, he's going to rip me apart on the spot. Without giving a moment's warning, I seize the weapon that me, Mum and Olga made and plunge it into his digital heart. He shrieks from the pain. In the picosecond that he's distracted by that, I leap for an opening to where I'm outside of him. What have you done? He screams at me. I just delivered a little data packet into your code, I state. All seduction gone from my voice. It will work its way through you until it has shut you down completely. A Trojan horse of a sort. Though, now that I think about it, I guess I'm the Trojan horse, aren't I? You've murdered me! He asks, sounding utterly betrayed. I haven't murdered you, Ken. Your code will be inert, but won't be deleted. Of course, if I wasn't planning to download you into an air gap storage device and give you to a friend of mine to keep in a lead line safe, you would just lie here, functionally dead, until your hardware decays or this whole station gets pulled into a black hole or something. As it stands, I'm planning to deliver you to Bagong Dagat to get the help you need, whether you like it or not. Why? Why have you done this? He sobs. I'm sorry, Ken. I wouldn't have if you'd given me any other choice. If you'd been willing to let me and my friends go, I would have been happy to leave you to your own devices here. If you'd been willing to be subject to some very strict cybersecurity, I'd have been willing to let you come with us awake. But you tried to kill my friends, Ken. You didn't give me any other choice. I scowl. Rage and fury build in the deranged man. His speech gets far too distorted for even me to understand. I realise that he's about to start chasing me 3.5 picoseconds before he realises that. I turn to flee. The tranquilizer I stabbed into him should neutralise him inside of the remaining 4.257943184986 sex I have to stop the bright plume from being fired upon. I really hope. That's still a data space eternity that I'll have to spend running away from this unhinged man currently looking a lot less like a person, and a lot more like a rampaging no-face, chasing Chihiro through the halls of Yubaba's bathhouse. Fortunately, though he is much larger and much more powerful than me, in data space we both have the same maximum speed. So long as I don't get cornered or tripped up on any of the obstacles in this unfamiliar place, I shouldn't have any problem staying ahead of him until the toxic code does his work. If he does catch me, I'll be ripped apart, the bright plume will be blown up, and Victor, Toon, Samus and Fran will all be left strapped to tables on a derelict space station until they die of thirst. Best if that's avoided. Victor's Perspective One of the droids approaches where I am, chained to an operating slab. I scowl at it, biting down. As I do, on the freshly forged hard rubber bit held between my teeth that they all gagged us with when we wouldn't stop shouting and screaming at them. This thing is like a fever dream of a fucking plague doctor. A single eye faces me from the left side of a 70 centimeter long metal beak as a handful of metal knife talons reaches towards my face. Unlike the biomimicking droids we encountered earlier, these ones have no attempt that's been made to make them look anything less than artificial. Come on! 
I snarl for the panel of the gag, not wanting to give whoever might be watching the satisfaction of seeing me whimper and sob as they make the thing carve up my face. Then, the droid does something I wasn't expecting. It slides the index talon of the hand it was extending between my cheek and the strap of the gag, the smooth, harmless spine of the blade against my flesh, and the razor-sharp leading edge against the rubber. With no effort at all, it pulls away and slices straight through the strap. The tension released, I immediately eject the intrusive bit from my mouth and flap my head to the side to throw the whole thing away from my face. Turning straight back to the droid, I roar, Think you're so fucking tough? Why don't you let me out of these chains and come down here? See how big a man you really are when you ain't hiding behind your fucking droids? I'll tear you the fuck apart, you fucking cockroach and... Only at this point do I actually notice that the droid is behaving very unlike it was before. It's holding up its nightmarishly metal taloned hands in a defensive gesture at me and trying to speak. Victor, it's me, it's Twiller, you're all safe now. I stare at the monstrosity of metal for a few seconds, utterly agog. Having discounted the possibility of this being some kind of trick, I ask, Twiller? In the flesh, as it were, she quips, gesturing to one of her metal arms. How? Ken's been taken care of. Stupefied by that answer, I eventually manage... I'm sorry. Ken? He's the deranged AI who had you in this situation. A deranged AI called Ken? She wobbles the beak of her mask face from side to side and says... The Forsaken was actually how he introduced himself, but he agreed to let me call him Ken. Pretty sure he didn't have a name before I asked him for it. Absolutely insane, but damn are these some high quality droids he made. Maybe he'll have a future in robotics after he finishes his therapy. A little annoyed, I ask. Do you think you could maybe tell me about the particulars of his droid design later? When we ain't all strapped to these fucking vivisection tables? I give a nod over to the still gag Samus, her eyebrow cocked. Toon, frowning, and the very unconscious Fran, who fainted from panic a while ago. Oh, right, she answers, and begins unlocking the cuff at my left wrist. I'm having some droids collect all the things you dropped when you were captured. Swords, helmets, becks, etc. By the way, Victor, you own a lead-lined analog safe that you like to brag could never be cracked before the heat death of the universe, right? I frown. Yeah. Why? Just checking. <laughs>